Welcome, welcome to Art in the Digital World. I'm your host, Brandon Town. And this show is about people and artists who use various technical and computer skills to create their art. Now, this week we have someone who I think really captures the spirit of digital art because he um, uses computers to create some really beautiful pieces. So we have here today Bill Schober. Thank you for coming today. Thank you for having me. So why don't we just start off by telling a little bit about uh, yourself and uh, kind of maybe a little bit about what you, what you have here that you're going to show us. Well, I uh, it was about eight years ago I uh, decided to try and build a CNC machine, a computer numeric control machine. And basically what it is, in my case, is a wood router that's uh, controlled by a computer. You set it up on a computer as to what you want it to do. It creates a text file that tells where the bit of the router will be at any given moment and sends it out as signals to stepper motors that move the router up, down, and around, and it cuts things out for you. Great. Now, I was, I was looking online about them, and it seems that they use it a lot in industries, big industries, to, to make parts, but you have kind of a different purpose for it. Can you tell us a little bit about that? <laughs> yeah, I like to uh, be a little bit more creative than making uh, hubcaps for uh, fancy uh, cars. Um, I've, I've always wanted to do woodworking, but I, rather, I lack depth perception. And I figured I'd be known as No Fingers Bill in no time if I tried doing it the traditional way. So I made a machine to do it for me while I do what I like best, watch television. <laughs> Well, I think it's a really uh, wonderful machine. Now, um, why don't you just uh, tell us a little bit about uh, how you came to want to make it? You have a really wonderful story that I love to hear, and I'd love to, love to hear the, the, the story. Well, I, uh, I know this uh, nice young lady uh, who uh, raised uh, four, four kids by herself. When those four kids were young, her brother came up with a name for her house, and that was Snickering Pines. And I thought that was a rather cute name, and I told her we should go to the county fair, have the sign guy make her a uh, sign saying Snickering Pines on it. And we went down there, and the guy, he had nice work, but it was like quarter-inch thick red, uh, redwood, and he wanted like $80 for a sign. And a lot of the work he was doing with a hand route, with a handheld router, but I looked inside his booth, he had a machine running. And I made the mistake of saying out loud what I was thinking to myself as I was watching it. And I said, you know, I bet you I could build one of those. To which Rosie said, well, why don't you, Bill? And here's where my true genius comes in. I spent about a year researching, another year building. And I got it all built, and I made her her sign. And to save $80, I spent 1000 Now that's the sign of sure genius. And all the parts that you got, you, you, you built it from scratch. We were talking earlier about how there's some kits, but you, you had a different approach to how you put it together. Yeah, I, I had bought in a couple people, or purchased a few people's designs, and I really didn't like them. There's certain things I liked, certain things I didn't. And one night when I was uh, saying my prayers, and I just finished, and I rolled over to go to sleep, and I had an epiphany. And the whole, whole machine was in my head, every nut and bolt. I made a rather crude drawing and went back to bed because I figured there's no way I'd remember it. And when I woke up in the morning, I still had the whole thing in my head. <laughs> it's changed a little since then. But. Uh -huh. And you've kind of upgraded it, right? <laughs> yes, considerably. Right. Well, um, why don't we go ahead and um, get ready for this video we have, this insert that's going to show Bill, because I got the pleasure to go to his house and get some really wonderful video of the clip um, showing the stuff, and then we can talk more about it. So people can really get the idea of what we're, what we're talking about here. So whenever you're ready, go ahead and play the video. Well, this is my CNC machine, which means computer numeric control. It's uh, controlled by a computer over here. I designed and built it myself, and it's uh, Kind of large as you can see, it's uh, 78 inches long and uh, 58 inches wide. It also, you can cut flat and on this guy here, it can cut round as in 
sticks like this, which start out square. I create, uh, I create 3D files on my laptop, bring them out here, put them into this computer, and it sends signals out to these stepper motors that move the apparatus up, down, and around. It's a little pixelated. Also you can see where I'm using a 1 8 inch bit, you can see the lines that it will create into it. Pretty funky. This is the Mach 3 CNC controller. We have a text file over here. Each line of text tells the machine where the bit should be at any given moment. So it sends signals, signals, pulses out to the stepper motors. This window here shows the uh, paths and where the path is overlapping so much it just looks like one solid piece. This column here tells where the, the tip of the bit is. Right now it's 1.7 inches off the surface of the cutting material and everything else is zeroed. I use this little guy. It a, it's a, goes on infrared and it's got a full keyboard and I use the keyboard, I use the up and these two arrows to move it sideways these two arrows to move it lengthwise and the up and down to bring it up and down. So X, Y, and Z. I load the text file into Mach 3 and it turns, turns it into pulses that come out through the printer port come into here you can see a printer port uh, connection here got uh, four chips on here that interpret the pulses and then takes the voltage the amperage and the voltage ups it so it's strong enough to move these motors This one is done in what's called v-carving, which I created a vector outline and told the uh, software what bit I was going to use. I used a couple of different bits. You can see on the tree here, the depth is over an inch, which is, I think makes it look real nice. This is, this is actually made up of one component being the dished in piece. Another component being each of the trees, another being the ribbon, and another being the text. And they're, they're in, this, in the uh, software, in the Aspire software, you actually see it as a tree. This being the mother, or the root, and everything laid on top of it. Some of it's merged, some of it's laying on top. Oh, I went online and I searched for a picture of a distal fink, which is, uh, I believe, Pennsylvania Dutch for a bird of good luck. And I found one that I liked. I used the same dish shape that I created for the other side. And then I, uh, I had these vectors. Each one of these shapes is a separate vector. Like the heart here was one vector. The heart line outline around it was another one. Actually a pair. And, I told, and then on this heart vector here, it had little circles in it. Little, and I told it, okay, raise up at a certain degree to a maximum of so much. And it did, and then I said, okay, inside these holes, I want them, want them to be holes, I want them to cut in so far. So I cut each one in so far. And on this, I did similar, and same for all of it, just went through piece by piece. You notice the eyeball even has a little pupil carved into it. Okay, on 
Here we have uh, four lithophanes, which is an ancient Chinese art. In this case, it's uh, been modernized a bit with a CNC machine and Corian countertop material. The old ones were made out of porcelain. Um, got some. 3D carvings, the Indian face going into an eagle, which is also back there in a larger size. Got my self-portrait. Got a little bit of the Last Supper over here. And we have a mother and child both over there in the smaller one and larger one. It's real easy to change size in the software. Got a little bird's eye. Uh, Bird's eye uh, redwood clock that I made. The uh, round posts over here were redwood 4x4s. You zoom in close, you can actually see fingernails on the dragon, the dragon's pupils even. It's uh, amazing what the machine can do. This was a photograph and had the computer interpret the lightest areas to be cut the deepest and the darkest areas to be cut the shallowest. When it's going back and forth, it's going up and down with the bit, cutting deep where it's supposed to be white, cutting shallow where it's supposed to be dark, and the gray areas in between are in between. This is backlit, but without the backlighting, it looks rather weird. And I think it's a really neat effect. The original ones, they carved in beeswax and then made slip molds with porcelain. Wow, that's, it's really cool. It's a really cool idea. I think that it's really awesome what you have there. Now, one thing that we didn't get in the video, tell us why you have the little, the little heads on, the, on the, uh, the, the, the motors. I like toys. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I like the visual. And it makes it easier when you're showing somebody how it works because uh -huh. they'll see the head turning. And, you know, that, I, I just like it. It's the kid in me also. Now, um, this is not the first one that you built. Um, this is the, you said that you kind of upgraded it. Tell us a little bit about that, maybe why you changed it. Well, the first one I made with uh, one inch steel tubing, square tubing, and it would sag in the middle. I even tried filling it with concrete and I couldn't get the sag out. Plus it wasn't that accurate. I was using, uh, you know, the, the rollers that you have on sliding glass doors? Mm -hmm. I'd have like eight of those on the rail, and that's what would guide it back and forth. And it's just, it was, it was okay, but it wasn't good enough. And I, I like things done, done right, so I rebuilt it with, uh, with fancy uh, chrome, uh, chrome rails that you, I think you saw in the video. And it's much more precise now. It, and I re got a really good deal on them. A gentleman I know uh, bought a shipment direct from a factory and gave me a good deal. And you told me that it goes faster. What, do you like the fact that you can do more, or does that help? <laughs> I, well, it impresses me when it goes as fast. I, I only tested it up to four times the speed as the old one, plus the fact that it's more accurate and doesn't sag, because I have very long rails, and when the gantry would get halfway down, it would be sagging. So if I was doing a large piece or a long piece, like, like say like something like this, when it would get to the middle, the middle would wind up being skinnier. Because mm -hmm. you see, this started out as a square piece of wood. It was one and a half inch, uh, actually in this case it was a uh, banister. Uh, uh, what do you call those, the ones that go up and down mm. on a deck? Uh, yeah, banisters. Anyway. Yeah, that's what this was. And then it cut it into a round with a, uh, with a uh, end mill and then uh, with a V-bit, cut the text in. Now, I have another one here, too, that you just did. Um, and maybe we can show this one a little bit 
closer. And this one's really interesting because it actually starts off circular, but then as it goes through, there's a sort of hexagon shape here. Tell me why you use square pieces. You explained to me before about why you use square pieces instead of round pieces. It's impossible to get, you have to have the exact center. So if you put in a dowel, a round piece to start with, you can't get the absolute exact center because when it's doing text, for instance, you see, if you can, you can't see it, I'm sure, with the camera, but there's actually squares in the very corners of the letters. That's done with a round bit. Mm -hmm. In order to do that, it has to know exactly where the surface is. If you don't have it exactly centered, you're not going to get good text or, or good images for that matter. Mm -hmm. And so it's all about being precise. Mm -hmm. And I think that the, the machine is really wonderful how it serves the two purposes, doing flat pieces, and then you can attach that motor to have it spin. And so with, when you do the flat pieces, you have three different axes, right? Correct. And when I do the round ones, I also have three axes. Oh. The, the uh, X axis is wrapped around the Y, so this will rotate forward and back, just like as if the stepper motor was going back and forth. So instead of the motor going back and forth, this is turning while well, the motor's going this way and this way. Well, this turns. So it'll go into like, say, the F here. It'll go in, go around, come back, go this way, that way, go around, and such. It's, it's pretty neat. So it's basically, to the computer, this is unwrapped and flat. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Now, if we can show this one, this is, this is what um, the design of that you actually worked from, and uh, it says art in the digital world. I, I really do love that, and you can really see the depth. Can you maybe explain uh, to us about uh, the different uh, elements? You told me about how there's different elements to the picture that you cut kind of in different sections. Yeah, okay, well, when I designed it in Aspire, that's the software I use, it's from uh, Vectric. You might want to check them out, vectric.com. Love the, those people. At any rate, I created a dish. I created, actually, I created a vector in that shape, and then I told the software I wanted it to, to scoop in at such an angle and so deep. And then I took, I took a tree that somebody else had already made, and I multiplied it four times, flipped it over, increased the size, changed the width, twisted it a little bit, made a banner, and put that on top. So actually things are laid on top and merged. Like the banner is merged with the trees, but the trees are sitting on top of the dish. And then, okay, this was all cut with an eighth inch ball nose in one pass, as you saw in the video. But then when it got done cutting it all the way to the end, I changed to a V-bit. And in the software I told it I was going to use a 45 degree V-bit. And it cut and told it to cut it in onto the three, 3D surface, because this is not flat. Remember I was explaining with the round, this isn't flat either, it curves. And the software knew that it curved and it created the, the path to cut the, uh, the, the V path in there and it cut it out perfect. That's really amazing. And I think that it's interesting that you work from this, in this example, you work with images that you can get, but you also, you do a lot of 3D work too yourself. It's not just putting some image and having it interpret. You have to actually do some of the modeling, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes, and I've, I've created quite a few things too. Like uh, the inside of that door, that Disselfink, that was, you know, I created the whole thing. But you can do all sorts of things this way. Yeah. And if you, if you look, I think a good example for like that particular piece is if you look at the uh, ancient Egyptian art, the base relief goes along the same lines. Mm -hmm. I think it was really interesting when we, when we were watching it too, how <laughs> it takes, how long, does it, how long did this one take to cut out? Do you, do you know about? It was a couple hours. Yeah, but w when I was there, it was funny to, it was so exciting to watch, oh, they're, start, they're doing the trees, and oh, they're doing the banner, <laughs> and, and, and getting really close and watching it. Yeah, when I've, when I've made pieces for other people, they've, I've actually had them stand, they'd stand out there for an hour just watching it with their jaw dropped. <laughs> yep, felt, felt like local yokels. <laughs> now, tell me about this conference that you went to. 
Oh, I, uh, I went to a users uh, group uh, conference in Las Vegas uh, about a week and a half ago, and it was for the Vectric uh, people that make Aspire. And it was pretty interesting. I learned a lot of stuff. I got to show off my stuff. And uh, I've, that's where I figured out uh, how to do the uh, six-sided piece, because it actually starts out as an eighth of an inch at one end, tapers up to an eighth and a quarter here, that's both round, then it transitions to a six-sided flat, back to an eight, uh, one and an eighth inch round, back to uh, 0.8 inches round. And it's rather complicated to figure out how to do that. Yeah. <laughs> and it was, it was fun. It was a challenge. And you were able to show the people there the video that we just watched? Yeah, they enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah, and a couple of them made comments that they, uh, they had to put the heads on the top of their uh, stepper motors because they thought that was neat. What scale do you think that yours is compared to some of the other people that they did, that, that, that they have the same kind of machines? Uh, well, actually, mine's pretty large. Um, there were people with commercial ones that are uh, by 8 foot by 4 foot. Uh, mine, mine is uh, pretty close to that, not quite. Um, but then again, theirs were commercially made and cost thirty-five thousand. Mine cost under a thousand and uh, does the same thing. Can you tell us a little bit about the kits that they have? We we're talking a little about the kits. Yeah, uh, you can you can buy kits online. You can buy plans online. The kits uh, basically they're, they're the pieces are already cut out and they have directions and you assemble them and you wind up with a pretty good machine. Do you, what do you think the difference is between, you know, what are some of the differences between the kits versus doing it yourself the way you did it? Well, I, I know every nut and bolt on mine. Um, I can also say I did it my way. <laughs> Sounds like a song, huh? And I don't know, I did, humility is not my greatest attribute, and this machine makes it very hard for me to be humble. <laughs> well, I think that you uh, created something really amazing. Um, what do you have planned for the future? Do you have an idea of how you might change it in the future? Actually, yeah, I was thinking of, uh, of changing the Z-axis a little bit uh, to make it more tight and precise. You know, with, when you're doing this kind of, you know, art slash uh, digital work, precision is what it's all about. Mm -hmm. The more precise it is, the better it comes out. I've always, <clears throat> you know, I've always, I've worked in digital, not worked, but I've played in digital world for a long time. I started out in fractals in the early 90s, actually 1990, and I've, I've always enjoyed that, that you can create things here and you know, get it into a computer and you can, you can make it so other people can see what you're thinking, which is something Oh, which is something I've you know always wanted to do, and this has really helped a lot. I I enjoy it; it's fun. What do you think about maybe go into a little bit more about creating art with computers as opposed to you know using a? <laughs> I know you said you might have difficulty if you did it by hand, but what do you think about using computers uh, to create the art? I, th I think it's another tool. I mean, I've I've done sculpture uh, w by hand. Yeah, I've, I've done uh, lost wax castings, I've done pottery. I'm not too good at painting. I, I think I, I don't have the patience for that. Um, but I think it's another tool and, and it can be used uh, to make some fantastic things. I, I mean, I, I just, do a, just go on the internet and take a look around. I mean, there's so many beautiful things you can create. And, and I think that's what it's all about, is uh, interpreting the world in a beautiful way. Do you think that it's um, helpful or, or good for people to try and do it the way you're doing, where you kind of build everything yourself? Well, I think everybody should do it their own way. You know, um, That was the way that worked for me, and that's the way I did it. Uh, I'm probably a little bit more stubborn than most. And that's one thing that's nice about being stubborn is you get to learn things. And another good thing about doing anything in digital work is you get to use your brain. And the more you use, it's like any other muscle in your body, the more you use it, the stronger it gets. Do you think that um, the creativeness that goes into 
all the technical side is is comparable to the creativeness of creating something like this, you know, the, the actual piece itself? Yes, I do. Is that too short of an answer? Yeah, because that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's what I think it's it's amazing. You know, do you think about not just the actual final piece, but what you had to the creativeness you had to come up with? There's a lot of problem solving, I'm sure. Yes. Yes, I, and I'll, I'll have an epiphany, and I love epiphanies. The, the most beautiful thing I think there is is an epiphany. I mean, you, you glow in the dark, <laughs> and then you get to take that, that, that uh, gosh darned epiphany and turn it into something physical, mm -hmm. and that's the hard part. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's fun. Like with, with, the, uh, with the V carving and the, uh, the 3D carving, when, when you're working with it, you have to tell the machine the geometry of the uh, tool so it can figure out, you know, so it can figure out how to manipulate it. There's a, there's, so there's math in there, there's, uh, there's creative in there, there's, it's, it's a whole ball of wax. Mm -hmm. So what do you think that some of your next projects are going on? I mean, where do you want to take this to now that you're, you're, you seem, you're really into it, so where do you want to go with it now? You know, I'm not sure where it's leading me, but uh, I'm, I'm sure I'll know when I get there. Mm -hmm. Actually, you know, you know what they say, it's uh, the destination is the path, is the journey. Mm -hmm. you know? So it's, it's constantly changing. And real quick, where do you think that the world of CNC is going? Do you think that there's uh, any kind of new technologies that are going to come about that are going to make it easier or better? Or? Well, people are using them with lasers now, and they're using them with plasma to cut, cut out steel. I've seen steel artwork done that way. It looks nice. I'm not going that way. I, I think we have enough forest fires in my neck of the woods. <laughs> well, I think that the uh, wood medium is really a great medium, and the, um, the lithophanes are really beautiful. What are those made out of again? Can you say one more That's time? a Corian, the same thing that they make countertops with. The, uh, the backsplashes, they use the quarter-inch Corian, which is what I use for the lithophanes. The lithophanes turn out pretty beautiful, I think. Yes. The lithophanes are really amazing, and I think um, we'll try and show a little more of it, too, um, in this video. Um, I really love the lithophanes, and I think that the, the really interesting thing about those is you get them from the computer, or you, get, you can take those from a picture and how they're negative, and so they're, they're really great. I even uh, made a color one once. Oh, cool. And I did that by... Uh, by uh, turning it into a CMYK. You know, if you know digital, you know what that is. And I took the K out, which is the shades of gray, and printed it on a transparency and attached it to the lithophane. Wow. That, that's really awesome. We'd love to see that. Well, Bill, that's all the time we have. It went by really quick. Thank you very that's much for joining us. And thank you for watching Art in the Digital World.